Welcome back. Am I, am I on? Can you hear me okay? Well, I don't know if y'all remember what I said back in April, but I said in a few minutes, we'll be right back here. That was a quick few minutes. I'm, seriously. Was that not quick? Yes. And um, anyway, so how many of you guys just raise your hand? Here? This is your first time here if you raise your hand. We're, we're glad to have you here. Um, we have been praying. This, this is our 10th year, and we started with about 75 men um, 10 years ago. And we have been praying that God would fill this room. And this afternoon, Steve Soros, who does all the stuff behind the scenes, said we actually hit 500 register today. And so on this... And I'm really, um, I'm so excited to be back. I don't know about y'all, but I need this. Yes. And so I just want to um, encourage you guys who are here for the first time, maybe this is the first Bible study you've ever been to. Don't drop out after tonight. Give it at least five or six weeks. And if you don't like it in six weeks, give it six more. Yes. <laughs> but I, I believe that... Um, you'll find that this is a great place to be on Tuesday night. Not because I'm here, not because really anybody in particular is here, but because the Lord is here. And I believe that God is going to do more this year than He's ever done in this study. We started with Romans 10 years ago. It was our introduction to the men's study at Eden Street. And we just did the first um, eight chapters back then. We're going to do all 16 chapters this year and um, we're going it's really I, I'd have to say it's um, <clears throat> if I had to pick one book out of the Bible to study it, it was kind of a toss up between two books John and Romans but I really have to believe that particularly if you put me um, like in a foreign country where there were no believers and I had to explain what Christianity is all about I'd have to go with Romans Romans explains what it means to be a Christian. Amen. So, um, and tonight, um, I kind of want to set the record straight because there's so much confusion about what real Christianity is. And so I've entitled this message tonight, What Christianity is Not. We're going to be looking at John. We're not in Romans tonight. We'll be at John chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. But before we get started, I'd like to pray. So if you bow your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we just uh, come before you tonight. I thank you, Lord, for bringing us back safely. I pray, Lord, for, for uh, those who are not with us tonight, that you'll bring them here next week. I thank you, Lord, for the new men that you've brought and the men who've been coming for, you know, for several years. I thank you, Lord, for um, rescuing a man like the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus and sa saving him and then using him to write most of the New Testament and then preserving the New Testament for us so that we here in 2015 can actually read your word and it's by your word, the Bible, that you've chosen to speak to mankind. Not usually audibly, but through your written word. And you've protected it for centuries from those who've tried to tear it apart, to rip it to shreds, to discredit it, to imply that it contradicts itself, that it was just written by man. And yet, when every man dies, the Bible will still be here. You're, you're, the Bible says heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will stand forever. And we have the privilege of opening up your word tonight and giving you the, the chance to speak to us. It's the privilege is ours. And say, Lord, I pray that you'll take your word and that you'll penetrate every square inch in this room and every square centimeter of every heart in this room. Penetrate our minds and our hearts with the truth of your word. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Okay, so I'd like to begin, as I do a lot of messages, by asking a question. Have you ever wondered what it really means to be a Christian. And in case you didn't know this, 
there's a whole lot of confusion out there in the world, particularly among those who, who go to church, about what true Christianity really is. You see, most people believe that being a Christian is all about going to church, trying to live by the golden rule, trying to, trying to be a good, moral, upstanding citizen. And those are all good things. But is that really what Christianity is about? And so what I would like to do tonight in just in the next few minutes is I would like to try to eliminate all the confusion that there is about what Christianity really is. And I want to do that by explaining two things. First, I want to explain what Christianity is not. And then I want to explain what true Christianity really is. And I'm going to go back and forth between the two explaining you know, what Christianity is not at the same time explaining what Christianity is. Now to explain what Christianity is not, I want us to consider a man by the name of Nicodemus. In case you're not familiar with Nicodemus, we learn about Nicodemus in the third chapter of the Gospel of John. Go home and read it tonight if, you know, before you go to bed. And here's what we learn about Nicodemus. Nicodemus was one of the most religious men in the entire Bible. He was a Pharisee and he was a member of the Jewish ruling council known as the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the ruling religious body over the entire nation of Israel. It was made up of 70 Jewish men and the high priest. And they ruled over every Jew in the, in the nation of Israel in terms of religious matters. And so when you think about Nicodemus, think about a, a, a bishop of a mainline Protestant denomination or the cardinal in the Catholic Church. And so in, in Nicodemus's day, he was known as the greatest religious teacher in Israel. He had great moral character. He was highly respected. As a Pharisee, he was thoroughly familiar with the Scriptures. In fact, probably every day he spent hours in the Old Testament, probably memorizing most of it. If Nicodemus were alive today, he would be the head of a major denomination, or he'd be a very respected professor in a divinity school. Now, if someone came to me and said, Russ, describe Nicodemus to me before he had an encounter with Jesus. And here's how I would describe him. I would say that Nicodemus was a very good religious man with outstanding moral character. Again, this is before he encountered Jesus. And before he encountered Jesus, even as a very religious man, he was blind, he was lost, he didn't know how to have a relationship with God, and he didn't have one with God. Now here's the million dollar question. How is it possible for a religious man like Nicodemus to not have a relationship with God? I mean, is it really possible for anyone to be so morally good, to be so thoroughly familiar with the Bible, to even be a great Bible teacher or even a great religious leader, and yet to be blind and lost? Do you know what the answer to that question is? Yes. yes. In fact, it's very common. I want you to understand this truth. If a man doesn't know Jesus personally, it doesn't matter how religious he is. He does not have a relationship with God. In, in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. On the night Nicodemus came to see Jesus, he did not know who Jesus was, and he certainly did not know him personally. And so tonight, you find yourself sitting here. Perhaps like Nicodemus, you long to have a real relationship with God. You just don't know how. Well, I want you to listen carefully to what Jesus said to Nicodemus. In John chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, Nicodemus, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's what? Born again. If that word see, it means understand. It's like when you see that 2 plus 2 equals 4. And what he's saying is that unless you're born again, you can't even understand anything about the kingdom of God. So Nicodemus said, how can a man be born when he's old? Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. And Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, 
No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. To which Jesus replied, You are Israel's teacher, and you do not understand these things? Now, I want to just explain one thing to you. When it says right there that the wind blows wherever it pleases, uh, our English word wind comes from the Greek word pneuma. And our word spirit comes from the same Greek word pneuma. So what Jesus was saying is that the spirit blows wherever it pleases. You cannot tell where, it's, where he's coming from or where he's going. And I just want to tell you this. The Holy Spirit is going to blow through this room, even as I'm speaking. And every time we gather on Tuesday night, I can't tell you where he's coming from or where he's going. But you will be listening to his voice. And if you hear him speak to you, you better respond. See, Jesus was amazed at Nicodemus. Here he was speaking to the most respected religious teacher in all of Israel, and yet Nicodemus had no idea who Jesus really was or how to have a relationship with God. Nicodemus did not even understand what it meant to be born again. Now let me ask you this question. When is the last time you heard a minister stand up in a church and tell his entire congregation you must be born again if you ever want to see heaven. When's the last time you heard that? I heard it a lot growing up in the 1960s, but it seems to become a politically incorrect thing to say. But that's what Jesus said. You see, Nicodemus was truly an example of the blind leading the blind. Welcome to America. Did you know that there are many thousands of people who go to church every Sunday, and yet they don't understand, many of them, not all of them, but many of them, they don't really understand what it means to have a relationship with God. Are you one of these people? Have you been going to church your entire life and yet you couldn't explain to a 10-year-old what it means to have a relationship with God? I want you to understand this. In order to be a true Christian, you must be born again. You see, being religious has absolutely nothing to do with being a Christian. In fact, if anything, being religious will drive you further and further away from God. The reason your study guide is entitled How to Be a Christian Without Being Religious is because being religious is actually a stumbling block to knowing God. A few years ago, a young man by the name of Jeff Bethke produced a video entitled Why I Hate Religion But Love Jesus, and it went viral. It, it had over 24 million views. It was so popular that he actually appeared on several morning TV shows, and I actually saw him one, one time on television. Again, it's entitled, Why I Hate Religion But Love Jesus. And here's how it goes. I was going to try to wrap this for you, but I'm not going to do that. And my son is real glad I'm not doing that. What if I told you Jesus came to abolish religion? I mean, if religion is so great, why has it started so many wars? Why does it build huge churches but fails to feed the poor? Religion might preach grace, but another thing they practice. Tend to ridicule God's people, they did it to John the Baptist. They can't fix their problems, so they just mask it not realizing religion is like spraying perfume on a casket. See, the problem with religion is it never gets to the core. It's just behavior modification, like a long list of chores. Like, let's dress up the outside, make it look nice and neat. But it's funny, that's what they used to do to mummies while the corpse rots underneath. Now, I ain't judging. I'm just saying, quit putting on a fake look. Because there's a problem if people only know you're a Christian by your Facebook. I mean, in every other aspect of life, you know that logic's unworthy. It's like saying you play for the Lakers just because you bought a jersey. You see, this was me too. But no one seemed to be on to me, acting like a church kid while addicted to pornography. See, on Sunday I'd go to church, but Saturday getting faded, acting as if I was simply created just to have sex and get wasted. See, I spent my whole life building this facade of neatness. But now that I know Jesus, I boast in my weakness. Because if grace is water,
then the church should be an ocean. It's not a museum for good people. It's a hospital for the broken, which means I don't have to hide my failure. I don't have to hide my sin because it doesn't depend on me. It depends on Him. See, because when I was God's enemy and certainly not a fan, He looked down and said, I want that man. Which is why Jesus hated religion. And for it, He called them fools. Don't you see so much better than just following some rules? Now let me clarify. I love the church. I love the Bible. And yes, I believe in sin. But if Jesus came to your church, would they actually let Him in? Now back to the point. One thing thing is vital to mention. How Jesus and religion are on opposite spectrums. See, one's the work of God, but one's a man-made invention. See, one is the cure, but the other is the infection. See, because religion says do, Jesus says done. Religion says slave, Jesus says son. Religion puts you in bondage while Jesus sets you free. Religion makes you blind, but Jesus makes you see. And that's why religion and Jesus are two different clans. Religion is man searching for God. Christianity is God searching for man. Which is why salvation is freely mine and forgiveness is my own. Not based on my merits, but Jesus' obedience alone. Because he took the crown of thorns and the blood dripped down his face. He took what we all deserve. I guess that's why you call it grace. And while being murdered, he yelled, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Because when he was dangling on that cross, he was thinking of you. And he absorbed all of your sin and buried it in the tomb. Which is why I'm kneeling at the cross saying, Come on, men, there's room. So for religion, no, I hate it. In fact, I literally resent it. Because when Jesus said it is finished, I believe He meant it. Man, I want you to really understand this truth. I wish I'd written that. In fact, listen, I've examined every line in that poem. Every line in that poem, to the best of my knowledge, lines up with exactly what the Bible says. And I I love what it says. When, that, when Jeff Bethke was on this morning show, they had a, a religious leader. I'm not going to tell you what denomination. It doesn't matter. And he was cr- so critical of him. And I wanted to say, hey, Mr. Religious Leader, this thing is talking about you. You see, today, right here in Raleigh, in all of our country, there are many people just like Nicodemus. They are trying to earn God's favor by being good and moral and religious. But man, I want you to understand this. Jesus never said anything about religion. He never said once, you must be a good person in order to be saved. He never said once, you must be religious in order to be saved. What did He say? He said you must be born again. And that's what it means to be a Christian. It's that simple. Isaiah chapter 29 verse 13 says, The Lord says, These people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is made up only of rules taught by men. Now can you not see that Isaiah is describing religion? You see, men, God created each one of us and He created us with a spirit. Did you know that's what separates us from animals? An animal actually has a soul. That's why, you know, your dog's got personality and he can actually think. You know, he can learn some commands. But a a dog and, and no animal has a spirit. The Bible informs us that we were all created in God's image and said God is spirit. And that's why we have a spirit. God gave us a spirit so that we can actually communicate with Him. But see, here's the problem. Sin. When mankind sinned, and going back to the fall of man, it left every one of us after Adam with a dead spirit. It's like having a lawnmower in your basement that has no fuel in it and no spark plugs. And that lawnmower longs to come alive. It wants some fuel to be put into it. And that's what happens when a man is born again. The Holy Spirit comes into you and makes your spirit come alive. And it happens the moment you believe. And that's what Jesus was trying to explain to everyone that He encountered when He walked on this earth. Is that you must be born again. 
When he met the woman at the well in John chapter 4, who was basically a prostitute, she was there to get water. And he said, here's what he said to her. He said, listen. He, he looked at her and he said, everyone who drinks this water pointing to the well will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. What was he saying? He was saying that if you drink the water I give, which basically means if you take his word and if you could pour it down into your soul and you believe it, then the Holy Spirit will come in behind that and make your dead spirit come alive. And then you, you have eternal life. I learned this when I was about 10 years old. I just couldn't explain it. But my mother, who died back in May, she shared with me about Jesus. And I accepted Him when I was about 10. And He came into my spirit and, and made me alive spiritually. And I've been that way ever since. Because see, once you're alive spiritually, you can never lose that. In John chapter 11, when Jesus came to the funeral of one of his best friends, Lazarus. And he was talking to Lazarus' sister, Martha. He said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And then he looked at Martha and said, Do you believe this? Let me ask you, do you believe this? That's why Jesus came into the world to give us eternal life. And when you believe in Him, God gives life to your dead spirit. That's what it means to be born again. And unless, men, you've been born again, you're not a true Christian and you will never see heaven. I want you to listen again to what Jesus said to Nicodemus. See, every word He says is so important. He looked at Nicodemus and He said, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. So how many births are there? There are two. Physical birth... You're here because of your physical birth. And then there's a spiritual birth. And here's a warning. If you are born only once, you will die twice. And the second death will never end. In other words, you will basically be dying in a dying state forever, but you never die. And you'll be separated from God in the source of love and life forever in a place called hell. When's the last time you heard about hell? You can hear about hell here. <laughs> but listen, here's the good news. If you're born twice, you only die once. I lost my mother in May. I lost one of my best friends, Paul Creech, in July. I lost another good friend, Bill Duff, about a month ago. And I lost one of my biblical mentors, Danny Lotz, about two weeks ago. All four of those men were born twice. They only faced death once. And see, death for them, just a doorway. Step through in paradise. How come Jesus offers that to the world and the great majority of the world rejects it? I mean, you must be born again. And that's what true Christianity is. Have you been born again? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 states, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Do you know what Nicodemus' problem really was? He failed to realize that he was on a religious treadmill that was going nowhere. He failed to, to see that he was blind and lost. And he failed to recognize that he was trying to find God on his own terms. And that's what all religions are doing, including churchianity. Religions are an attempt on the part of mankind to come to God on their own terms. You see, what Nicodemus really needed to see was his need for a Savior, and he needed to see Jesus as that Savior. And that's what some of you need to see. It doesn't matter how many times you've said the Lord's Prayer or recited the Apostles' Creed or been baptized or gone through confirmation. I had a friend of mine one time who I asked, I said, um, so tell me, I don't remember how I worded it. I was probably pretty blunt. He said, tell me, when, when were you saved? That's pretty blunt, isn't it? He said, well, I think it was when I went through confirmation. And you don't want to think about that. You need to know. It doesn't matter how good you are. You can never be good enough. Romans 3, 23 states, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are all sinners. See, Christianity is not about 
what you do. Christianity is all about what's already been done for you. Aren't you glad? Doesn't that take the pressure off? Aren't you tired of going to church, doing the church thing? Now listen, I love church. You, you need to be in church. But aren't you tired of doing the church thing, thinking that that's what saves you, and it leaves you feeling a void of, of uh, any real meaning? You, you feel like you're just doing something out of duty, and it's empty. Aren't you glad to know that you're acceptable to God just as you are? That's why I love that song that they sing at Billy Graham Crusades. Just as you... What is, what's the name of it, Stefan? Just as I am, I come. So you can just come as you are. Jesus has already taken care of your sin problem. When Jesus died on the cross, He said it, it is finished and He meant it. Nothing else has to be done. All you have to do is recognize your need for a Savior and place your trust in Jesus. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 12 and 13, Jesus said this, and I love it. He said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. What do you mean by that? Is anybody righteous? So what did he mean? Well, he, he meant that if you think you're righteous, you have no chance of hearing the gospel. It's only when you recognize that you're a sinner that there's any hope. See, the first step toward becoming a Christian is recognizing that you're sick and you need a doctor. That you're blind and you need to see. That you're lost and need to be found. That you're drowning and need to be saved. And that you're dead and you need to be made alive. Nicodemus was religious and lost. He'd never been born again. He didn't even understand what it meant. But the good news, as you read through the rest of the Gospel of John, Nicodemus, over the course of time, so usually with a religious person, it takes time. With a blatant sinner, they, can, they already know they're a sinner. So they hear the Gospel and they'll respond to it quickly, usually. But a religious person, he's got to be convinced. Let me think about that a little while. I'm a pretty good guy. I haven't really, let's say, committed murder. Hadn't committed uh, adultery. Although I was checking that girl out the other day. See, Jesus raised the bar. He said, if you've harbored hatred in your heart, you've committed what? If you've looked at a woman lustfully, anybody ever done that? Then you've committed what? Adultery. You ever told a lie? How many take them out that you want me to go through? You jar I've broken three of them. I've broken every one of them. He can't find one I hadn't broken. I wish they'd come up with an 11 or maybe I hadn't broken that one. <laughs> See, at the end of the Gospel of John, we find Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, who was another Pharisee, asking for the body of Jesus so they could bury him. At this point, they were willing to be associated with Jesus because they believed in him. And they took Jesus and buried him in Joseph's tomb which fulfilled prophecy that was written back over a thousand years early in Psalms. It said that he would be buried, that the Messiah would be buried among the who? The rich. The Pharisees were all rich. How about that? You want to believe the Bible? Just check it out. There's not one prophecy in the Old Testament that has not been fulfilled that has had time to be fulfilled, if you know what I mean. Just read the Bible. I'll put it up against any science book, any history book, any body, anybody in the world. It has stood the test of time. How about the thief on the cross? You ever thought about him? Two thieves, Jesus is in the center. One believes and one doesn't. Both criminals, criminals probably there for murder or some capital crime. And the thief, I think on his left, looks at Jesus and he says... Will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? Now you think about this. That guy had probably never stepped into a church. There weren't any churches yet. He'd probably never been to the synagogue. I doubt he'd ever read the Old Testament. And yet Jesus looked at him and said, I, He said, I tell you the truth. And when Jesus says that, what should you do? Listen, He says, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. You see, that... Um, thief did not have to be convinced he was a sinner. He knew he was. What did Jesus see in his heart? He saw faith. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. 
I mean, I want you to understand this. Religion can never save anyone. Do you know why? It's because religion can never wash away your sins. Religion can never give you eternal life. Religion can never bring about the second birth. You see, all religious activities when not accompanied by biblical faith. And let me say that again. All religious activities when not accompanied by biblical faith are nothing more than paint on a rotten building. They're nothing more than spraying perfume on a casket. They, the Bible says that without faith it's impossible to please God. You can go through all kinds of religious ceremonies. And listen, they're all wonderful if they're done by faith. But if they're not accompanied by faith, they're a waste of, they're a waste of time. Now what does it mean to have real biblical faith? It simply means that you look to Jesus to save you. You, you come to the point in your life where you recognize that you're lost and you cry out. All you have to say is, Jesus, save me. All you have to do. A child can do that. Paul writes in Romans 10, 9 and 10 that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Jeff Beth, you got it right. The problem with religion is it never gets to the core. It's just behavior modification, like a long list of chores. True Christianity is a work of God. Religion is a man-made invention. True Christianity is the cure for our sin problem, while religion is the infection. Billy Graham once said, religion is like the vaccine that stops you from getting the real thing. Let me tell you what Christianity is not. It's not about anything that we can do to save ourselves. Until we find Jesus, or actually He finds us, we are lost and without hope. And if God had not acted 2,000 years ago, we would be lost and without hope forever. But God did act. And that's what Christianity is all about. God pursuing us. He is the hound of heaven coming after you and me. That's why you're here tonight. You know why you're here? It's, well, you think it's just because a friend invited you. But it's because God is pursuing you. And He's brought you here for such a time as this. All we have to do is place our trust in Jesus and we will be saved. You see, Christianity is not a religion. It's about a relationship with God through His Son, Jesus. And this relationship happens the moment you truly believe. In that moment, you're born again and your spirit comes alive. And that, my friends, is what Christianity is. Romans 10, 13 states, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. At some point, Nicodemus called on the name of the Lord, and he was saved. Have you ever called on the name of the Lord? If not, call on Him while you can. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You so much for Your Word. And I just pray, Lord, for a man who's sitting here tonight who heard the Gospel maybe for the first time. In fact, with every head bowed, listen, nobody open your eyes. I'm going to open mine, but nobody else. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. If you want to place your trust in Jesus Christ tonight for the very first time, raise your hand. You might be here. I see one hand, two, two hands. Anybody else? I'm not gonna, nobody's going to open their eyes. I'm not going to call you forward. Just raise your hand if you want to go to bed tonight and know that if you were to die in your sleep, you'd step into heaven like that thief on the cross. Just raise your hand. Another 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 hand. Four more hands. Another hand. Keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed, please. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You don't know where it's coming from, and you don't know where it's going. It's like the wind. You can feel His presence, but you can't explain it. I believe the Holy Spirit has blown in this room tonight. And I believe that some men have made a decision that will affect their eternal destiny. 
Lord, I can't imagine what you're going to do the rest of these nights if you've already done so much tonight. Well, thank you for these men. I pray that they will go home tonight before they go to bed and read John chapter 3 and know that they have, if they were not so before tonight, they are so now. They have truly been born again. We love you, Lord. Protect all these men. Bring them back safely next week. It's in your precious son's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I'll see you next Tuesday night.